Hey, everybody, welcome to Red May, your one month vacation from capitalism, your chance to riff on red, to eat red food, to wear red apparel, and of course, to read plenty of Karl Marx during the month. Uh, we have uh, 10 days left, I think. No, we have, my God, we have seven days left in the month. And uh, a great many events coming up. I want to clue you into a few of them before we get into today's event, the, the uh, price of slavery. Um, tonight at uh, um, the Beacon Theater uh, in Seattle, if you happen to live in Seattle, uh, I'm sorry, that's tomorrow night. We have a chance to see Red Psalm by Miklos Janko. Uh, he won the Best Director Prize at... Uh, 1972 in Cannes, and I can attest you will never have seen anything quite like it. It's one of my favorite films. Uh, we uh, have a couple of days off and then resume again on uh, May 26th, Thursday at uh, 11 a.m. Communism is found in unexpected places. Jose Carlos Mariategui on aesthetics, sciences, and internationalist politics. Uh, with Young Kun Choi, Alejo Stark, Karen Ben Ezra, and Diego Arrocha Paris. On the 27th, I'm sorry, we have another one on the 26th at 3 p.m. Nixon's War at Home from COINTELPRO to Counter -terror Terrorism. It's the name of a book by Daniel Chard. Uh, Daniel will be there with Atiyah Hussein, uh, Cedric Johnson, and uh, my old classmate from Columbia, Mark Rudd. Uh, the former head of Columbia SDS, and later the Weathermen. Uh, on the 27th at 11 a.m., uh, a panel called Freedom uh, with Albanian political theorist Leah Yippi. And I'm going to have to check with her on the pronunciation of the name. It's spelled Y-P-I, and I may be making it a sort of a 60s sound into Yippi, but... Uh, that's my best guess at the moment. Michael Hart will be there with Martin Hagland and Vanessa Wills. Uh, at 3 p.m. on that same day, What Was Neoliberalism? with Sarah Briette, Nikhil Pal Singh, Joshua Clover, and Jamie Merchant. On the 28th, on Saturday, Uno Kozo's Theory of Crisis with Richard Westra, Ken Kawashima, Wendy Matsumura, and uh, Gavin Walker. Uh, and on the 29th, uh, there's no such thing as the economy at 11 a.m. with Samuel Chambers, Cordelia Belton, uh, and Soren Mao. Uh, and finally, on the 30th, uh, on Monday at 11 a.m., uh, Spectre, uh, the wonderful new journal, uh, or relatively new, presents Ukraine, imperialism, and the world economy with Yulia Yurchenko, who will be broadcasting from Ukraine, Ilya Matviv. Uh, Rebecca Carl and David McNally. So lots of good stuff. How do we pay for it? Well, we don't get any institutional support. We depend on you. Uh, so go to our website. Uh, at the donate button, you'll find our Patreon. Uh, or uh, you can find our GoFundMe, Fan the Flames of Red May. We depend on the kindness of strangers like Branch Dubois. All right, enough of my prattling. Let's get on to the main event today. The Price of Slavery is a book by Nick Nesbitt. Nick teaches in the French and Italian department at Princeton. And he is the author before this of a book called The Concept in Crisis. Uh, he's noted, aside from his uh, uh, specialties in Caribbean and uh, French literature, uh, for his work on Althusser. Uh, so uh, the price of slavery comes as a as a kind of a, a welcome surprise. Uh, Nick, could you sort of give us an outline of what the book's about? We have an, uh, uh, two other panelists who I'll introduce before they speak. Great, thank you, Philip. Thanks. Uh, it's really a pleasure to be here. Thanks for the invitation, and uh, also to the other speakers, to Susan and to Joshua and Stephanie Smallwood, who couldn't be here. Um, and it's really an honor that uh, we can discuss the book and uh, and a pleasure. So this this is a book that I, I, I wrote during COVID really. And uh, it comes out directly, I have to say, it comes out of sort of a social media argument 
that I got in uh, uh, with some people and the, uh, the, the value form uh, discussion group on Facebook. And we were talking about slavery and capitalism and that uh, ongoing debate since Eric Williams uh, and before CLR James. And, and so these, um, there were some really smart readers of capital that uh, were uh, maintaining to me uh, that slave labor in capitalism produces surplus value. And I was saying back to them, it, 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 no, it doesn't. If we, if we follow Marx's conceptual argument in capital, uh, it, uh, slave labor doesn't. It produce, slave labor produces commodities that can capture pr profit on market, but not surplus value. And so we were back and forth and no one was, was changing anyone else's mind. And so I was uh, really convinced that this is an important question. And I was doubly convinced when then I went back and reread some of the, the classic literature since Eric Williams and Capitalism and Slavery and the historical historiographic debate on that book. Uh, since its publication in 1944, and and I thought that in I found, uh, and it seemed to me that in that historiographic discussion where there were there are many rich and fascinating positions for and against uh, Eric Williams' famous theses about the role of slavery in the uh, uh, the growth and consolidation of capitalism and in the reverse, the, the role of changes in capitalism in the abolition of slavery in the 19th century. But I had the conviction, the more I went back to these classic works, I had the conviction that there, there was sort of a theoretical deficit, let's say, that there were rich readings of the historical archive, but that there was a certain um, theoretical underdevelopment of this sort of question. And so the book, as I say, it was written during COVID, but it was also in the context of the political changes we've been and, and, and problems we've been living through the last few years. And in this context, the context, the immediate context of this argument I was getting into, uh, I, I found myself confronted also by the problem of, of uh, epistemology and truth and, and how does one demonstrate um, uh, uh, convincingly, apodictically, we could even say, the necessary nature of slave labor and its place in the capitalist social form. And so it seemed to me, it seems to me still that um, in these times, these so-called post-truth times that we're living through, as well as all of the political challenges and catastrophes of, of racial violence and racial capitalism and, and the Black Lives Matter uh, movement, all of these problems that I think we're also living through a period in which epistemology is very much uh, a political matter. And so even though the book in its first half uh, rehearses um, uh, at, at a high level of abstraction, Marx's, Marx's arguments about the creation, the nature of surplus value and its relation to slavery, I think very much that these, it's my conviction that um, these questions are, are really in the period we're living through uh, political pressing, political problems, and so, and so I, I, I sort of stepped back and tried to re, uh, uh, rethink and reconceptualize and give a theoretical framework, make a theoretical intervention around the problem of capitalist slavery, which is to say, uh, to try to systematically construct, theoretically, not historically. Uh, not phenomenologically, not in terms of the lived experience of plantation slavery, nor in terms of the narrative reconstruction of archival documents, but theoretically to try to construct this object, capitalist slavery, which is already 
to name following Eric Williams' initial argument. I mean, Eric Williams' book, one of the reasons why it's such a momentous intervention is already encapsulated in its title, Capitalism and Slavery. And that conjunction in that very simple title that he had to fight very hard for to retain uh, as the title of his, his book brings together these two objects in a very powerful way uh, and, and, a, and in, in a way that made it obviously very contentious uh, in its time. Uh, and, and I wanted to take that challenge that Eric Williams set forth just in, in that conjuncture of these two conceptual objects, slavery and capitalism, and to, how do we think them together as one concept, capitalist slavery, which is to say slavery within the historical delimitation and the social delimitation of what Marx calls the capitalist social form. So not his uh, slavery as a trans historical phenomenon of uh, human suffering, subjection, exploitation, etc. But the place of slavery specifically within the capitalist uh, social form dedicated as it is uh, to the creation and accumulation of surplus value. And so within that project, my, uh, the framework that I'm working with uh, is, is specifically Marx's capital, which is to say uh, that I, I, I needed to, uh, after making, a, 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 so in the first chapter, reviewing some of the, uh, the what I see as, as some of the theoretical contradictions or shortcomings of the literature on capitalism and slavery since Eric Williams or, or just simply theoretical underdevelopment. In light of that, to return to capital in its three volumes in its uh, incompletion and to try to reconstruct systematically, not everywhere that Marx mentions slavery, because there are places throughout the three volumes and elsewhere of, of capital in Marx's writings, where he says contradictory things. And so you can sort of cherry pick here and there. Uh, slavery does, slavery doesn't produce surplus value. What is its place? But rather to follow through Marx's demonstration in the first principally in the first chapter, but really the first six or seven chapters of Capital, uh, where he shows the nature of, of surplus value and its creation uh, and the necessity of, uh, of uh, labor power as the sole commodity within the capitalist social form capable of creating surplus value. And then to, to make the, the straightforward claim, because Marx's focus in capital, of course, isn't slavery, but, but rather the fundamental principle nature of the creation of surplus value and the capitalist social form. And slavery in that argument reappears in many different places, but it plays a subsidiary role. But it plays a crucial role in certain key moments, for example, in chapter six, where Marx uh, solves the riddle of the creation of surplus value, right? Uh, here is Rhodes' leap, uh, uh, the problem that had uh, been unresolvable for traditional political economy, uh, that is given the equal exchange of the, the exchange of two commodities of equal value, where does profit come from? Where does surplus value come from? And he shows, of course, in chapter six, that it comes from the single sole commodity labor power. But he makes this crucial distinction uh, uh, right in the first couple of paragraphs of that chapter between slave labor and uh, labor power and commodified labor power. And of course, slavery uh, the slave is turned into a commodity in capitalist social form. And the slaves are bought and sold at market. Humans are debased into mere commodities, as, as Stephanie 
Smallwood shows uh, in, in a richly argued book. I know Susan is going to talk a little bit about it later on, but it's it's really a, a stunningly rich description of that process as as a lived experience that can be recovered from the archive. But I wanted to make a theoretical framing argument, uh, uh, which shows you following Marx's argument step by step, uh, why it is that to be a commodity within the social capitalist social form, why uh, uh, a commodity requires necessarily a monetary form of appearance. And so here I was drawing on recent readings of Marx and Capital as a monetary labor theory of value that stresses in the, the, the second and third section of chapter one in particular, the necessity of the monetary form of appearance of commodities, uh, which of course slave labor by definition, as Marx says in, in, in chapter six, slave labor can't have a monetary form of, a, of appearance. Only the slave has a price, not the labor. And so that distinction to argue and show in, a, in, a, in what's hopefully a convincing way required following Marx's argument step by step and linking that argument more systematically than he does at each step to the case of slavery. And then the conclusion being that in the capitalist social form, slave labor uh, is, <clears throat> is because it doesn't possess a monetary form of appearance, it can't take on a, a, a commodified relationship with all other commodities in the capitalist social form by definition, essentially. Uh, uh, but then that leaves this further question of then what is its place? Because obviously we know uh, since C.L.R. James, since Eric Williams, since furthermore Robin Blackburn, all of these very, very rich demonstrations of the key place and role that slave labor played in the accumulation process of the development uh, and, 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 and reproduction of capitalism since the 18th and 19th century. But if it's the case then that slave labor doesn't uh, produce by nature, by definition, as Marx shows, cannot produce surplus value, what's its place? And there, I think the, the conclusion is, is, is fairly straightforward. It's simply that slave labor, like any other means of production, aside from the commodity labor power, produces commodities like animal power, like wind power, uh, steam power, robot power, produces commodities that may or may not be uh, capable of capturing a profit at market, but without, excuse me, without them themselves that in that production process having uh, produced surplus value. And so, uh, I think that that argument depends crucially on grasping surplus value in what I think is the the the, the correct way of reading uh, Marx's argument. And you know, here, as I say, I'm I'm, I'm reading Capital in its first chapters, especially as a monetary labor theory of value. So I'm following uh, people like Michael Heinrich. In, in, in particular, and uh, Fred Mosley and, and, and others. And so I think that that distinction requires, uh, th that, that uh, argument requires distinguishing uh, uh, an understanding of surplus value as a material substance from uh, uh, that is uh, produced by the physical materiality of human labor in any single instance or situation or material form versus what I think is the correct uh, uh, relational way of understanding surplus value. That surplus value, unlike material use values, cotton, sugar, 
the labor of, of slaves or, or windmills or robots, but exchange value, which is a, a, a relational instance and requires a relationality such that commodities can enter into relation with one another and that relational uh, process, the capitalist social form, is uh, 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 defined, I think, by Marx in the very first sentence, first paragraph of, of Capital as a, as a generalization of uh, uh, commodities and commodified relationships. So not simply one, the exchange of one commodity for another, but in a situation where there is a mutual and general and even universal exchangeability of all commodities for one another that requires, that generalization requires the monetary form of appearance of all, of all commodities, a price form, right? And uh, uh, so that requires grasping, I think, correctly, surplus value as a, as a relational concept rather than as a material substance. Um, and then, so let me just encapsulate that. I'll, let me say the book is divided up into two parts. So the first part I've described just now, which is this theoretical reconstruction, uh, sort of a literature review of the literature on cap uh, slavery and capitalism, a second chapter that's trying to theoretically reconstruct Marx's systematic demonstration of the nature of uh, 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 slave labor and its place as a uh, uh, within the capitalist social form. And then the second half of the book is, uh, we could say, maybe a series of case studies within uh, uh, Caribbean, um, the Caribbean context. And so there's, there's a chapter that addresses, uh, returns to CLR James's Black Jacobins and tries to uh, argue that uh, James, uh, uh, his, that he had an approach, I was trying to look at CLR James not as uh, a work of Marxist humanism, which is the obvious way to read it, and, and James's, uh, the context of James's mid 20th century Marxism is obviously a Marxist humanism, humanist one in, in addition to many other original aspects. I wanted to follow on a couple of instances where James indicates the scientific systematic nature of his investigation. And I wanted to look at his argument about the Haitian revolution as something like a, a structuralist argument about the nature, the necessary nature of successful revolution. And, uh, and so I try to reconstruct that and try to twist James into this sort of a, 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 a Althusserian mode of, of reading him against the grain. Uh, and then there's another chapter on, on Aimé Césaire, another Caribbean Marxist humanist. And I try to think about the ways that Marx, that Césaire's writing uh, 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 addresses the problems of uh, slavery and post-slavery, especially in late capitalism in 20th century Martinique, uh, uh, there's a there's a section on Jacques Stéphane Alexis, and I end up looking at Suzanne Césaire's work. And for me, she's or she only has a few brief essays, but they're so powerful, they're so original. And uh, from the perspective that I'm developing in the book, uh, she she really is this fascinating figure because though she only has these couple of six or seven very short essays. She is alone in this um, Caribbean anti-colonial Marxist humanist uh, 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 field of thought in the mid 20th century in refusing, rejecting systematically the, 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 the call for industrialization, for example, the call for wage labor for everyone as an unqualified uh, uh, um, good. And she takes a step back from that. And she's not arguing systematically, of course, the way that Marx is in, in capital, but she, she refuses simply to call for more industrialization, for wage labor, for, for all 
colonized subjects as a, as a necessary good and a, and, a, and, a, and a goal. And she calls that into question in a way that I think is very original and very powerful and very uh, visionary. And, uh, uh, and, and so Suzanne Césaire is, is this very important figure in the book. And uh, uh, just, to, just to, to wrap up uh, the, the, these comments here, so we can, I really wanna hear what uh, Susan and Joshua have to say and to open things up to discussion. Um, I, I don't know if we can bring up the image of the cover and I just make one quick comment on it because I think if, if this is visible for people, this, this is the image that I took for the cover of the book. And, I, and I've been looking at this image for 20, 25 years since I first found it. It's from a banknote. They had a whole separate monetary system in the French Caribbean in the 50s and 60s. Uh, and, and this image, uh, when I come back to it now in the context of this argument, beautifully, uh, richly, encapsulates this triangulation that's at work in the book for me, which is to say between the, the, the human subject, who's visibly probably not anymore a slave, but she is apparently, to, to my reading, a producer and uh, bringing the commodity to market for exchange, then in her hands, the commodity itself, in this case, a, a bowl of fruit. But the, the third element, that I'm really emphasizing in, in, in the book is, is, is this monetary figure uh, uh, of the, the monetary value, the value form of this commodity that she's holding up for exchange, the 5,000 uh, francs or 50 nouveaux francs. And, and so I really like the way that this, this image in its sort of ideological naivete maybe uh, beautifully frames this this triangulation at, at work in the the production of commodities that I'm emphasizing in in the book and so um, maybe I can leave it at that at more there's more to say on the Haitian Revolution and events and labor and social form, but I think maybe we can just leave it with that image. And I'm curious really to hear what Susan and Joshua have to say. Thanks. Well, let the ghostly voice introduce uh, Susan here. We're happy to have you. Susan uh, is, teaches at Cornell and she's the author of many essential books, uh, The Origin of Negative Dialectics, uh, the dialectics of seeing perhaps the first substantial book on Walter Benjamin's Arcades Project in English, uh, Dream World and Catastrophe. She has a book called AD1 uh, Now, uh, which I was lucky enough to find at half price, a new copy. Uh, and I'm curious to see what it will reveal. It's such a departure uh, from the other books. But of course, the book that we're all thinking about now, uh, given Nick's topic, is uh, her, her acclaimed book, Hegel, Haiti, and Universal History. Here it is. Uh, go out and buy it if you don't have it. Susan, welcome to Red May. Thank you so much. Uh, it's really a delight to be here. Uh, uh, I want one correction. I no longer teach at the private university of Cornell, but I teach at the CUNY, the City University of New York Graduate Center. I'm a happy member of the faculty there uh, with a very different sort of student and I'm enjoying it very much. Uh, and I wanna to say to Nick, it's so good to see you again. When I first started writing Hegel and Haiti, you were, one, you were at one of the first presentations of this in the audience. I think it was in Illinois or someplace, I'm not sure where, but it, it's always delightful to have these kinds of uh, ongoing discussions separated by we will not say how many decades. Um, and I am terribly sorry that Stephanie Smallwood is not here. Uh, her book also has a fantastic cover uh, this, uh, it's not uh, described as much as I wish it had been, but there seems to be a, a genre of art in Ghana of uh, Fante slave, uh, or pardon me, Fante flags. Uh, this, it, these are people on the shore of the area from which uh, many of the slaves came during the period of time that we're 
concerned with. And um, it, it makes such a good illustration, I'm big on images, a good illustration of one of her major points, which is that the flag that is the country of belonging of those people ripped out of kin and social relations uh, in, uh, in Africa did not have some sort of continuous historical experience in the new world, but it was an absolute rupture. And she does use a, a phenomenological approach in a, in a really, really interesting way uh, to, to make us understand just how, how, how traumatic and how uh, inhuman this initial stage of the capitalist social form was, and I'm going to call it a capitalist social form, whether it's surplus value or merchant uh, profits, uh, because of the dehumanization of uh, the laborer or the slave. Uh, and she she does this on the one hand by showing us how numbers are important and the the uh, the um, the number of slaves named either man, woman, boy, or girl, those were the only four categories, who were put on the slave ships. And then uh, also capturing some extraordinary stories. And the one that kind of ends her book is about this uh, slave in the United States called Sybil, who, um, who can still remember the moment that she was ripped out of her brother's arms, that she was she was uh, uh, torn, literally torn from her social belonging, to be put on a slave ship, and even to the that day when the story was told, she uh, understood herself to have been lost from that relationship, and that her brothers were still looking for her. I mean, it's it's an enormously uh, deep. It's not just phenomenological as a method, but it's deeply, deeply um, effective. Um, and I myself felt in Hegel and Haiti that the idea of a continuous tradition from Africa to the New World was much too uh, optimistic a picture, but she really uh, gets at the heart of that inhumanity. And that inhumanity, whether it's, classical, uh, uh, you know, capitalist labor form or not, is the, perhaps the necessary uh, prerequisite for the capitalist relationship at all. Um, I, I really do recommend her book. Uh, and she does deal with what she talks about as a social form of capitalism. Um, it was a form of expansion of means of production that had agency, uh, uh, had increase. Africans were made to buy more Africans. In other words, the, the profits from Africans and slave labor bought more Africans. And this is the double inhumanity when your very slave uh, productivity uh, creates more uh, uh, slaves uh, coming to the Caribbean. So this is, um, it's a story that is not so much at odds with the effectiveness of um, any Marxist account of slavery, uh, but it lacks the uh, theoretical rigor of Nick's book. And here, um, you know, here we, we really are in methodological territory. I, I am quite willing to say that, that Nick has nailed the classical Marxist, um, the classical Marxist, um, I'm, I'm, I'm distracted by evidently my dog is in the picture. I'm sorry if that's the case. Excuse me, the classical Marxist notion of uh, the labor relationship. 
I was quite surprised to hear that Nick actually has an Althusserian past because I have down here on my notes, this is Althusser, this is structural Marxism, it's theoretical Marxism. And that then leads to, has classically led to a problem, which is how does this theoretical analysis of a system where, um, where uh, the agency in the process is internal to the system, how does that relate to history and to history's unfolding? And at the time of Althusser, but not only him, also uh, thinkers like Stuart Hall in England, uh, the word conjuncture actually taken from Gramsci became extremely important. In other words, you have a system of capital which is functioning in this very pure, theoretically rational and inevitable way. And then you have, uh, you know, what can break into this? What kinds of political possibilities emerge? And the notion of conjuncture, once you've got the analysis right, you can map out how the specificity of the particular relates to everything else. That is the particular event, how that relates to the system as a whole. Um, and this, um, what worries me about this way of getting to history from the pure theoretical analysis is that it is, um, it seems to fall in with the logic, a political logic of leaders and followers. It's Leninist, let's say, not Stalinist, but Leninist in its uh, understanding, when you understand the conjuncture, when you have that kind of insight into how the theory is uh, uh, coming into contact with the actual historical moment, when you are there, then you can lead uh, uh, strategically and tactically in the right direction and cause the revolution to happen. So the politics that comes out of this in the classical Marxist, uh, pardon me, the classical Althusserian uh, uh, description of the system of capital it seems to me is still an unanswered question by Nick. In other words, what, what is the political work being done by this rigorous uh, and detailed analysis from a, a Marxist theoretical point of view of the function of slave labor? So that would be a question that I would have uh, to Nick uh, if he feels uh, interested in responding. Um, when Smallwood deals with the social formation among slaves who made the crossing, uh, it doesn't seem to me that she, it, I mean, it seems to me that she is doing phenomenological history. And as someone who is sympathetic to history in general, that was the whole basis of Hegel and Haiti, there couldn't have been an argument in Hegel and Haiti if I didn't take um, uh, history absolutely seriously as the politically significant uh, uh, axis of analysis. So I, I find that that, that a troubling, um, I mean, you were talking, Nick, about a, a certain lacuna, certain lack in the uh, theoretical understanding of slave labor. But my question then back is, what is the political um, what is it, how would you respond to what I see as a political lack in the way the argument is unrolling? So I'm not quite sure what is politically at stake in the discussion. Certainly, and I couldn't agree more, there is a refusal to see slavery as a pre-modern or feudal relation as a stage of history. And Eric Williams is rightly lauded in your book for his position here. Um, although he is criticized for not being able to ground his thesis in Marxian theory. And that seems to be Nick's task. And one of the uh, recurrent themes that comes up maybe three times in the book is beet sugar, right? So uh, uh, Eric Williams makes a comment, you know, that when beet sugar became more profitable, that was really the end of slavery. It no longer had a logic in the capitalist system. And that fits in very well 
uh, with your uh, analysis of the slave as a means of production as opposed uh, to a relation of production. So first it comes up and you say it's so significant, William says it, but he doesn't know what he's saying. Then it comes up in another moment and another moment. Um, and I guess I might want to counter that this whole question of beet uh, sugar is a is a historical one. So aren't we back in to the contingencies of history uh, and how uh, because uh, uh, slavery continues, you pick sugar, but if you look at cotton, slavery continues. It continues after the Civil War and integrates beautifully into the capitalist economy of the newly reconciled, supposedly reconciled uh, United States. I mean, a book that's really great is Aaron Caraco's book, Black Market. Terrific uh, on showing how once the slaves were uh, freed, they had to be kept working on the cotton plantations. And the way this was brought about was to produce a monetary relationship of debt. In other words, get anything you want at the general store, but then you have to pay us back and you can't leave your job on the plantation until you pay us back. Uh, in this regard, which is, you know, the, the political freedom, this is, we're back here to the classical on the Jewish question, right? That, uh, or, or uh, Marx's critique of Hegel's philosophy of right, you know, political emancipation is not social emancipation and it can never uh, uh, resolve what, uh, the, what social freedom uh, requires. It can never be enough. I thought that your analysis of uh, the Code Henri was fascinating. I don't know anybody who's read and taken seriously the Code Henri, and I, I really found that uh, very interesting. Um, but interesting for me as a historian, rather than a theorist of capital. Right? Um, so then I would say, So Nick is saying here at, uh, that the end of racism and the end of capitalism are not the same project. This is what I'm, I'm reading into your understanding of the contemporary political significance of the work that you, you have just done. Um, and rather than implying that race or gender are not primary, but rather secondary contradictions, he, or I think you believe that political equality and social equality ought not to be confused or equated in the analysis of structures of oppression. You don't use these words, so perhaps you're not saying that, but I think it is important insofar as there is a great uh, discourse that you hear in uh, media, certainly, by black media uh, presences who talk about equality as, I want to be as wealthy as any white person. So there's this uh, very uncritical uh, uh, understanding of what that capitalist relation is all about. Uh, so I see that as operating here. Um, and so I don't wanna to take too much time. I'll just say another book that I find really important from a historical point of view is uh, Manu Karuka's Empire's Tracks. I don't know if any of you have run into that. Indigenous nations, Chinese workers, and transcontinental railroads. I find this extremely interesting. It's just 2019, I believe. Uh, it's extremely interesting because it shows how all three of these working groups, or not worker, all of these oppressed groups, politically and economically oppressed groups, function together to create the historical uh, event of a transnational railroad. Uh, so that these were different experiences of violence, different experiences of ex exploitation, but simultaneous, and all of them were necessary for the consequence, the historical consequence, right? Um, and on this notion of violence, Stephanie's book is so good on, on, on making us aware of the initial necessity of violence uh, to make the slave but to make the capitalist uh, worker relationship possible. And that that violence also had to be hidden somehow in the numbers, right? In the way that huge numbers were put together and they were only called man, woman, uh, boy, girl. 
They were not uh, people. You, you could, hearing about them, have a very clean conscience because they weren't people, because they were commodities, right? So uh, that I think is extremely um, important. Um, and I think the only other thing I will say here in regard to violence, um, that that violence is it, just like primitive accumulation. It doesn't, it's ursprüngliche accumulation, as we all know, which is uh, actually simply outside of the system of capitalist production of surplus value, the constant infusion from outside of something that allows accumulation to keep going. And of course, as we all know, Luxembourg is important there, et cetera. And that's that's a very important part of it. But not only this uh, this uh, ursprüngliche accumulation, but also the violence. That violence is always there. And there's something in the um, Althusserian uh, description of relations of production, you know, of C plus V or whatever way you want to call it, you know, versus. Uh, uh, means of production, there's something in that language that, that obscures the violence in my estimation too much, which is for me the advantage of rescuing the historical uh, approach. And in regard to this, I just want to point out, and this is just a little bit uh, my, um, my uh, hobby horse, if you will. I happen to hear uh, one of the early sessions, and I'll close with this, of Red May uh, with my former colleague uh, Enzo Traverso, uh, giving a, a talk about, you know, the uh, left-wing melancholy and things are so bad and we're all kind of in a gloom, etc. He gave something like that. I mean, the book has been out for a while. Uh, before, the, uh, before the pandemic, when I heard him at, at uh, Cornell, a live performance, and I asked him the question, um, well, there were no women theorists in his canon of all the depressed and left-wing melancholic uh, uh, critics of capital, of capitalism and uh, mod modern society. And I do want to point out that there's, again, I know them through their work in historical analyses of these topics. It's been a real flowering of women in this field. So not only Stephanie Smallwood, but Lisa Lowe, Sylvia Winter, Sadia Hartman, again, all of them using history and using a kind of phenomenological approach. Uh, or someone like Jennifer Morgan, who has a new book out talking about numeracy or statistics. Again, this idea that if you make numbers out of these inhuman uh, relationships, uh, you can somehow um, allow yourself uh, the luxury of, uh, of sleeping at night. Or uh, Lila Khalili's works on uh, container ships because there is a way that this slave trade turns into a modern form of capitalism. Um, and not only uh, her book, but one that's underway right now by Charmaine Chua, C-H-U-A, which has the working title Logistics Leviathan which sees the whole logistics revolution in uh, the global trade, contemporary, uh, as a counter revolution and talks about, and so we begin to see, you know, Alan Sakula could be put into that mix. We begin to see that a slave trade isn't the end of uh, the capitalist relationship. It goes on in very interesting ways. As a historian, I would be interested in that, uh, in that story as well. And I guess that's about all I have to say. You do have uh, um, uh, Cesare in there as your, Suzanne as your woman there at the end, and I very much appreciate that. Um, but, uh, you know, you do say that she is a Marxist humanist and therefore she misses uh, the significance. This is, of course, Althusser's critique of Marxist humanism from Sartre to his own time. Uh, so I guess, my most serious question to you is uh, what political work does this return to a kind of neo-Althusserian concern for uh, the specificity 
of the analysis do. And I do this with enormous solidarity because I know, Nick, that we're on the same page on a political sense. Uh, but sometimes I, I uh, have trouble following that thread through your wonderful new book. Thank you. Um, off of there I am. Okay. Uh, thanks very much, Susan. And uh, we are eagerly awaiting Charmaine, Charmaine Schwa's book, as we loved Lale's. They, they've both been at Red May several times. Uh, and will be again when the book comes out, I hope. Uh, I, I, I neglected to mention uh, a very curious coincidence that this week the New York Times is starting a one-week in-depth portrait of Haiti, where it's radically mm -hmm. revealing the results of which radical research has discovered for many years, namely that uh, Haiti, that uh, we have a case of reparations in Haiti, only it's gone in the, it went in the wrong direction. The, mm -hmm. the slaveholders had to be paid 40% uh, of the GNP for, for many years. Uh, and we will hear about the US occupation and so forth. But uh, there, there's an interesting discussion as to how to take that, whether saying welcome to the party, dude, or uh, to be critical. But in any case, uh, no more digressions. Uh, I'm very happy to welcome uh, Joshua Clover, a mainstay at Red May. Of course, you know Joshua. Uh, riot, Strike Riot is one of his uh, 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 best books. It's from Verso, but he also has a number of books of poetry, Red Epic, Madonna, Anno Domini, and The Totality for Kids. And speaking of totality, he's in a wonderful uh, anthology that's out, uh, edited by the late Ken, Kevin Floyd, among others, called Totality Inside Out. Uh, he teaches at the UC Davis. Joshua, welcome back to Red Bay. Thanks, Philip. Uh, and thanks, of course, to everyone who's helped arrange this, the Red May backstage team, which is uh, um, expands every year, has more and more work to do, and, and really does an amazing job putting this all together. And thanks to uh, Susan for for sharing this occasion with me, uh, someone whose work, uh, Phil mentioned Dialectics of Seeing, which threw me back. That was a couple of years ago. That book came out, but it was really transformative for me, and um, I was happy to be reminded of it. And I'm really happy to be here uh, with Nick as well. I think, uh, as we'll see, uh, Susan and I end up very much in the same place, at least in terms of a fundamental political inquiry, although maybe by somewhat different routes. Um, by way of trying to offer a useful response, I'm going to limit myself to a single moment or a thread in the complex and dense tapestry of Nick's book. Before doing so, I want to say that uh, I'm in some sense most compelled by the book's manufacture itself, by its commitment to method. Now, by this, I do not mean that the book is Marxist, uh, but rather that uh, instead of picking and choosing convenient quotations from Marx, like many soi disant Marxists do, it concedes that those can be shifting and ambiguous, and instead endeavors to reconstruct a systematic framework that can then be applied to history and not applied abstractly which is to say, according to the orthodoxy, which returns the same purportedly Marxist results, no matter the conditions it confronts, but rather applied in a way that is open to changing results as the conditions of history of themselves change. This capacity, this openness of method is visible in recognizing, for example, that the productivist inclination, one that the book identifies with Lenin, but finds to be an almost unwavering horizon in Antillian Marxism, must yield before the environmental annihilation that characterizes industrial development. The book's central inquiry concerns what separates and distinguishes the slave from the wage laborer within the categories of Marx's critique. As to what unites them, it remains relatively quiet. I do not register this as a failing, as neglect or a blind spot. That would be a bad faith reading, I think. It's just its own question. And it is entangled with my other question. I'm interested most of all in theories of revolution, including those which appear in this book. So all of this returns me to my single moment. Having made the move in uh, conceptual framing, the book uh, the books makes the move from Marx to C.L.R. James at more or less its midpoint. 
Nick makes a bravura account of James's 1930s trilogy on the French, Haitian, and Soviet revolutions on the years 1789, 1804, and 1917. And with the book's blessed rage for order, he notices something out of place. The account of the French Revolution fails to include the quote, leader of genius. I'm going to be quoting a lot because I like Nick's language better than mine. I'm going to borrow it as much as I can. The French account fails to include the leader of genius. 1789 is thus a headless revolution. Correspondingly, quote, this analysis is undoubtedly the weakest link in James's general notion of mass revolution. After all, the book wonders rhetorically, is not Robespierre precisely this figure of genius structurally equivalent to Louverture and Lenin? And so the book suggests that James might have returned to this matter and changed his verdict on this missing moment of leadership. The oddity here is that James in actuality did something like the opposite. Given more time, more historiographical knowledge, and a broader historical trajectory to examine, James backed away from the leader of genius in general. And in specific, uh, the case of Louverture in 1804, revising and arguably reversing his own 1938 stance in the Black Jacobin between 1963 and 1971. Nick's book does not conceal this fact. Rather, it simply disagrees. Asking the question, what should James have done? It answers, quote, quite simply, he should have shown that the general notion of successful mass revolution was identical in the French, Haitian, and Russian cases alike. Now, this formulation clarifies that what is at stake here is not fidelity to a leader of genius, nor to a thinker of genius, but to a theory of revolution. What James abandons, read the Haitian revolution, in the years between 1938 and 1963 is the belief in, again, I quote, a leader of genius is necessary to focus the anonymous and even unthinking passion of the masses, or more simply, a Leninist vanguard theory that James originally finds operative, although certainly not identically so in the Haitian and Russian revolutions. And this abandonment in turn, and here I must quote at length, arguably enacts the gesture of theoretical simplification characteristic of such leftist thought. The reduction of social conflict to the binary opposition of a shapeless mass and an oppressive state apparatus, a conflict and struggle devoid of mediating resources, leaders' parties' ideas that would modulate and focus this conflict. In 1938, James thought otherwise in place of this theory of leftist spontaneity, the first edition of the Black Jacobins offers a detailed analysis of the political struggles in Saint-Domingue, if not those in France, in all their enormous complexity." End of the quotation. In short, rather than demoting Louverture, James should have advanced Robespierre, but not for the sake of consistency. Instead, he should have done so by way of turning uh, more, not less, toward revolutionary vanguardism. Now, I personally am unconvinced that the revolutionary theory of a Leninist vanguard is more complex or subtle or nuanced than an attempt to understand what is sometimes called spontaneism, as it has been argued from Rosa Luxemburg to Fanon to W.E.B. Du Bois' account of the Black general strike in Black Reconstruction. But the point is not that either revolutionary theory is superior in some abstract trans-historical sense, Rather, there is a specific historical question here. It can be asked in many different ways. One way, the way I'm going to attempt, is to ask what might have changed between 1938 and 1963, or 1971, beyond expanded historiographic information. What might have changed materially in the world in ways that might inflect James's reevaluation of Louverture, which is to say, according not to me, but to Nesbitt, his theory of revolution. Now, toward a provisional answer to that question, I want to take up a topic that also follows immediately in the book itself, the question of the proletariat, and particularly its definition, which can only mean its composition. Now, I have not the time to take this up in the detail that it deserves. Suffice to say that the book worked through a number of possible understandings of the term, attending to the fact that there are not only pre-capitalist definitions, 
any citizen of the lowest class in Roman society, those whose only activity is to produce offspring, but also multiple definitions offered even within the mature marks. These include notably competing definitions in adjacent chapters of capital and not just adjacent, but decisive. The structurally oddest feature of capital volume one is that chapters 25 and 26 are adjacent, even though they stand at the greatest distance, both logically and historically. Chapter 25 summarizes the consequences at the far end of capital's process of self-undermining production of non-production as proletarians are expelled from wage labor by compulsory productivity increases. Chapter 26 leaps backward to narrate the historical origins and preconditions for capitalism to take hold, the so-called primitive accumulation. In chapter 25, Marx identifies the proletarian as a wage laborer distinguishing them not from the slave, entirely entangled with capital's compulsions to value production, even if they themselves are not productive laborers, but instead from the pre-capitalist figure of the primitive forest dweller. In chapter 26, however, the proletarian is one who has been wholly dispossessed, whether or not they engage in wage labor. As Marx notes, quote, this free and rightless proletariat could not possibly be absorbed by the nascent manufacturers as fast as it was thrown upon the world. Now, this is the whole ball of wax right here. Two images of the proletariat, one in which there is no distance between them and the working class, moving in and out of contracts to sell their own labor, one in which there is a necessary gap between the proletariat and the working class, which limited in scale by the level of capitalist development cannot possibly include all of the dispossessed. Again, our task is not to decree which of these is right, but as always to understand the ways in which this is a historical question. It is easy to imagine how from the perspective of 1864 or 1917 or 1938, the two categories, proletariat and working class might seem to be moving toward an identity as industrial development drew in more and more labor. It is just as easy to see how by 1963, these two categories might appear to be in the midst of a historical divergence. After all, there is Fanon, writing in French in 1961, translated in English 63, naming the lumpen proletariat who had never been wage laborers, but rather were people dispossessed from their tribe and their clan, who constituted, I'm quoting Fanon now, one of the most spontaneous and the most radically revolutionary forces of a colonized people. There is CLR James's comrade, James Boggs, also in 1963, as if by magic, writing, America is headed toward full unemployment, not full employment. In 1971, James gives a lecture, How I Would Rewrite the Black Jacobins. A year later, Gilles Dove writes, here's an extended quote, if one identifies proletarian with factory worker or with the manual laborer or with the poor, one misses what is subversive in the proletarian condition. The proletariat is the negation of this society. It is not the collection of the poor, but of those who are dispossessed, without reserves, who are nothing, have nothing to lose but their chains, and cannot liberate themselves without destroying the whole social order. I'm almost at an end, but some summary is in order. While it was never the case that the proletariat and the working class were one and the same, there were places and moments wherein it was plausible to imagine that condensation. Collapsing the two categories has certain implications for a theory of revolution. It supposes that a proletarian revolution is a working class revolution. With all the implications for ordering that follow, it separates the wage laborer from the slave politically with the same abstract force of political economic categories that reduces humans to variable or constant capital. But if this is the case, the Haitian revolution cannot have been a proletarian revolution for it was certainly not working class, certainly not conducted by those who earned a wage for selling their self-possessed labor power. It was however, a revolution of the dispossessed, a revolution of those without reserves. In this sense, it was the great proletarian revolution of its time. And in this sense, it bears a rhyming relation to struggles of the present 
of the era that we might start in 1963 or 1971 or the long crisis more broadly, reaching a recent acne in the summer of 2020, a period in which the divergence of proletariat from working class uh, has become not just self-evident, but arguably the central political fact of our era. It is worth noting that this divergence is racialized and gendered, that those discarded from the circuits of the formal wage, as well as those never included, are more likely in the West to be non-white, non-citizens, not guys. But it is not one against the other, proletariat versus working class. We can register one as a subset of the other, a revolutionary category that can join the wage laborer, the slave, the dispossessed native, and join their children's children's children. This proletariat, those without reserves, far more resembles what this book names the shapeless mass of what it correspondingly names spontaneism. I am not sure these are the terms we would all settle on, but I am sure that what, su what, what such language wants to name is that which characterizes the most intense and widespread struggles of the present. Those which I think that history asks us if we apply our methods with care and seriousness to recognize as our present spaces of revolutionary potential. Uh, thank you very much for the chance to respond. I look forward to the ensuing conversation. Uh, um, and I thank you everyone for, everyone for joining us. Nick, Susan, and Joshua. I think uh, before I ask some questions or take them from online, <clears throat> uh, Nick, why don't you uh, take a moment to respond uh, to Susan and to Joshua? And then I have a few sort of follow-up things, which I'll come in with. Okay, great. Thanks. I, I just want to say immediately, Susan and Joshua, I'm, it, this is so helpful and insightful, and uh, there's a lot to think about here. And I'm, I'm really, again, I'd say I'm really honored that you've taken the time to so closely read and read the book and raise these questions. Let me just get right, I think, as you say, Joshua, there's a lot of there's some overlap in your in your perspectives, and so let me just get right to this question about uh, the Susan voice, just political work, the political work that the that the book does. And Joshua, I, th I thank you also for framing uh, uh, this so nicely between these two moments and focusing on the CLR James, because for me that. Um, that uh, chapter and maybe the one after it really uh, uh, helped me to think about you now now the, the book is there and it's 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 its own thing and to it, you're helping me get a little distance from it and and this question then with the political work that it does i think um susan you you mentioned Althusser, and I have been reading a lot of Althusser in the last decades, but I think the, the person that I really have been working with in the last decade is Spinoza, who's sort of behind this, this orientation and this, this in, in many, many ways. One way is, is this trying to work on the sort of a systematic demonstration, even, you know, not more geometrico, but, uh, but systematically, and, and to see uh, uh, how that systematicity of argument, of demonstration, is at work as what Macheret, for example, uh, has called a positive dialectic in Marx, not just in Spinoza, but in but in Marx, not a ne not a negative dialectic, not Aufhebung, but not not in terms of existence and history and uh, but in terms of demonstration but another way that spinoza is is mixed up in all of this for me is the political and and i think that the james uh, the way that i'm trying to read james against the grain uh, is is uh, i think i can understand uh, a little better in this light which is if we think about Negri's readings of Spinoza, for example, uh, uh, to think about um, the Haitian Revolution as an insurgency, as the power of the multitude. And I think that's something that, that immediately is very powerfully articulated and, and, and evident in the Black Jacobins. But 
I also tried to link that up without you know, bringing it to Spinoza, but to link that up with this systematicity of, of argument that I was gesturing toward that, that is, is really an, an undercurrent. Maybe it's just something that I'm, that I'm making up or making out of CLR James. But in any case, I, I try to get a lot of mileage out of this scientificity of revolution. And, and for me, that, that's linked directly with, with the, the political, which is to say that at stake, I think, for, for CLR James, um, you've both mentioned sort of Leninism. And, and I, I, I don't think that my own, I'm not trying to make my own political intervention here in terms of Leninism. In this case, I'm trying to simply follow James, who in 1938 was very much a committed Leninist, and one aspect of that of that argument is this this necessity, as he sees it, of the of the either the great leader or or some sort of a theoretical focalization of the this of a mass movement, um, and and so uh, uh, what what I wanted to do, I think, was to try to articulate those two dimensions together that are that are so powerful. For me, anyway, in, in the Black Jacobins, the one is more evident. This sort of insurgency of the multitude, I think, is is something that's prefigured in a, in a very powerful, brilliant way uh, in 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 James's analysis. But what's less noticed is this sort of systematicity of his demonstration and and analysis. And of course, he's not he's not the way that Marx is doing in the first chapters of Capital. He's not, not making a, a highly abstract conceptual demonstration step by step of the necessity of, of the form of revolution, but he makes these comments along the way that I think are, are systematic and he wants them to be. And he writes these three books looking at different historical cases of the Bolshevik Revolution, the Haitian Revolution, the, the, the coming and, and, and nascent African and colonial revolutions, and he wants to, to, to get at what we can understand of the necessary nature of a, of a, of a successful anti-colonial revolution. And whether or not he's, he's right about, as you say, Joshua, it's not about taking sides, but rather determining the, the role that that sort of an argument makes, plays in, in, his, in his historical demonstration, which I was trying to build up and, and put some light on because it's not so obvious in the historical narrative, I think, in that famous book. And, and, and then, so, so then finally, uh, I, 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 I really appreciate, Joshua, the way you, you articulate this question of the proletariat and the, the, the question of the historical transition and differences, 38 to 63, and, and, and that's really, really powerful and and for me and and that leads to this question of transition another sort of articulation of a historical um, problem uh, uh, where in the first half I am taking this very sort of abstract conceptual framework but in in these other chapters in the second part the problem of transition for example these transitional labor regimes that Carolyn Fick has pointed to uh, CLR James's former student, of course, and, and, and I tried to think about the ways that we can take an, a, a conceptual understanding of, of the place of slavery within the capitalist social form at a conceptual level and look at, for example, the historical problem of the transition in Haiti from 1791 to 1815, 1820 with the, the Code Henri and, and how we see these different codified forms of labor and how a conceptual analysis that I've tried to articulate in the first half can be brought to bear on these sort of historical moments in Haiti that uh, 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 might not have been, that perhaps because of that framework might be uh, uh, better articulated in terms of what sort of a transition of forms of labor are, are going on in this period. Um, so those are, those are just a couple of ways that uh, your, your comments suggest to me 
um, modes of articulating the conceptual and the historical and the political in, in what's at stake here. So um, maybe I'll leave it at that and, and just thank you both again for your generosity and insights. So, uh, so here's a, a question or a kind of a long train of thought that leads to a question. Uh, I think the theoretical story you're telling also has a strong political goal, which is uh, to find two parts of the left movement that don't talk to each other very well and to have provided a kind of uh, way of envisioning how slavery works that is a point of entry for both, which could mean sure. on the ground a lot more, a lot more of a sense that we're part of the same struggle. For example, you know, the one extreme position would be, uh, no, 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 slavery is not part of capitalism. Basically, it's another mode of production, right? The other extreme position would be something like, yes, I mean, slavery is capitalism. It, it's basically it's organized like a factory and so forth, uh, you know, and there are all sorts of kind of historical reasons that are uh, proclaimed as to why it is capitalism. But what you're trying to do is you're not invoking more modes of production uh, uh, to incorporate slavery. You're saying, no, it is part of the capitalist mode of production. Here's the role that it plays in that, in that, that production. And, you know, you've talked about how humanist Marxism uh, uh, and other kinds of Marxisms uh, depended mostly on reading things like the German ideology or the economic and philosophical manuscripts. And a lot of people just didn't read Capital at the time. Well, now we're obviously in a moment, uh, obviously people like under the, uh, the guidance of people like Heinrich and others, where Capital is being read again and again and again. And when it's trying to sort of understand the, this kind of scientific research program that Marx ha had written out. So, so let me pose a question. Here's a question that someone asked online, and I'll put my addendum on it. Uh, slave owners purchase slaves as commodities, whereas capitalists only purchase a worker's labor power or their capacity to work. Since slaves are, you claim, only constant capital, they can't produce surplus value. But since capitalist workers produce value beyond what they are paid, they can produce sur surplus value. I suggest, on the contrary, that the view that the slaves are constant capital is not Marx's opinion, Marx's opinion, but the opinion of the racist slave owners. What you seem to be doing in your book is to look for a way to explain how capital slavery can function from the perspective of the slave owner who starts with false and racist assumptions. And my addendum to the question is a uh, thought experiment. Someone comes up to a factory owner and whoever and says, you know, I'm tired of trying to exist in this precarious environment. I can't afford the rents. They're going up all the time. The food is going up with inflation. You know, I have to look for jobs again and again. I want to sell you my labor power for my whole life as long as I can sleep in the factory, in the cafeteria, and so forth. Uh, you know, you don't have to pay me. Now, I mean, we're even seeing that happening in the university. I mean, a job, I think it's the University of California. Somebody offered an adjunct job for no pay, you know, and they they, they took it off after. The, but I'll throw that out as a, a kind of, can't we under that sort of experiment see a kind of sale of labor power for a longer period of time than uh, is usually uh, uh, done? So... Nick, Joshua, I mean, both of you take that one. Yeah. Joshua, did you want to answer? Uh, uh, I, I can say a thing or two for sure. I mean, I mean, I've, I, I will admit that that um, I'm trying to read against my own grain, right? Which is like I'm a professional Marxologist, and I'm, I'm like trying not to um, do that task. Uh, so I'm a little reticent about the thought experiment that, that Philip has proposed, which is interesting. I just mean, like, it, it lures me into going somewhere I'm not sure I find uh, totally useful. So I, I would just note maybe something else slightly different, which is that Phil set forth um, 
the two different possible positions, slavery and capitalism are one mode of production or they're two different modes of production. I think there's a different like way to think about like two different position, p- positions in the present, which would be to use some of different names like uh, orthodox Marxism and Afro-pessimism, right? And um, as two very different political conceptions that in fact share this exact thing, right? If someone else has made the, the clear, strong argument that slaves are treated systemically as constant capital, it's Frank Wilderson, right? That's, that's his account of like, it's commodities in the whole that we don't see in the slave ship, right? Because they're, they're pure commodities. So what's striking is that Nick's account from a, 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 a Marxist, I think it's fair to say, a dangerous term, but um, from a Marxist position and Frank's account from an Afro-pessimist position actually are the ones that hold that that uh, um, that share that supposition, whereas it's possible, I think, to, to say like, well, actually, I'm not sure I buy that. that and, and Phil's looking for a way like, oh, is it really true? Can we test that? Um, I think for me, the question would be like, where are the lines of political solidarity? And again, I say this like in, in the spirit of questions Susan was raising early on. Um, like what opens up the possibility for political solid solidarities um, uh, uh, across the line so that we don't have to decide whether um, wage laborers and slaves are the same category of, of object within the st- structure of capital um, or same category of subject or one subject and one object. Uh, but like, wh- where do we see the opening of the, the possibility for a, a political solidarity? And I, I would sort of keep on wanting to turn it back to that uh, question. And even within the framework of Marxology, uh, or, or whatever, or the categories that Marx uses in his in his critique of political economy, I, I still think we can hold on to this idea of um, of being dispossessed or being separated from your own capacities, right? In 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 the way that the, the slave and the wage laborer differently, but both share the category of being separated from their own capacities through compulsions, different kinds of compulsions, but still real compulsions, right? And the share the sharedness of that dispossession by the compulsions of value extraction, I think sort of wash away the Marxological questions of who's producing surplus value and who's C and who's V and allow for uh, political solidarities and that allows for revolution. And and certainly we have a point where uh, slavery has come back in at the end of the uh, logistics line as a kind of useful way to extract value. Could, could I, am I connected? Please. Susan, yeah, I'm yeah. just thinking uh, on this word that just was kind of put in there like a coda or a footnote, you know, lead to revolution, right? I mean, I do think that the, uh, the um, uh, part of the political question, right, is what we can mean by revolution today. And I, um, that's where I find by not unpacking that. In other words, Nick, I want you to write a book <laughs> that will clarify and systematize this notion of revolution in Marx or without Marx or whatever. Because, um, you know, as I say, if the revolution is that women and blacks get to be uh, anchors on TV, uh, yes, that's a revolution in a sense. And even Fox News has got to do it, right? So there's a way that. Um, this equality, even social equality, understood particularly in the monetary form of equal pay for equal work, or, you know, or if you're a, so- a soccer player or whatever. I mean, that is a social form of equality. It's not just political emancipation. It's a social form of equality uh, through the monetary form. And, um, you know, I've heard it argued that that's a precursor. First, we have to go there, and then the revolution happens. I've heard it argued way back to by Della Casa, whatever her name was, and the two Italian, that Italian pamphlet that came out, that the reproduction of labor is an unpaid expense, which if it were paid, i.e. housework were paid, uh, labor uh, wages for housework, the name the uh, the folder was, or the the pamphlet was, uh, if if they were paid, it would break the back of capital. I mean, I also think one might go to it from another direction, but I'm not sure how, and maybe you've thought of it, or you know other people who have, which is uh, from where, Nick, you, you, you 
position your political uh, stance several times throughout the book, which is this industrialization leading to destruction of life on the planet, you know, um, which I do, th I mean, I'm convinced that Anwar Shaikh was right in the 1970s when he argued at the New School that the, uh, that the falling rate of profit had hit zero. So that in a certain sense, the monetary form of capital's accumulation hides the fact that it's all coming from the outside, that it's all primitive accumulation because you can't, uh, you're getting rid of laborers. So if you're getting rid of laborers with the uh, with ports becoming worker free, you know, how is that going to uh, generate more v, v of variable capital in the in in making M prime? It's not going to do it. So I'm thinking that the that uh, but it would it would take a, a totally different notion of revolution, and I, I get little glimmers of it sometimes in certain places, but to me that's now the unthought category that uh, your book and this discussion would leave me with. Um, you know, in a certain sense, you know, uh, you know, crack capitalism, and aren't we glad that we are now on the brink of another global? recession or depression, we could get excited about that. But I, you know, it, it always hurts the people it shouldn't hurt before it gets uh, to the to the problem, right? So I'm just wondering in this kind of moment um, where in a certain sense, uh, it's too historical for you to go back to an Althusserian thing. So I'm arguing for history on one level, but on the other level, I'm thinking that uh, uh, historically we may be in a, a very, very different Position. So my sh short question to both Joshua and Nick and Philip, you have an answer. Uh, what is revolution? Well, there's one good thing that I think Nick brings up, makes in his book. Uh, you know, I, I agree with what Joshua said by, before, but I want to make one argument for one Marxological abstract point. And that is for the notion of left Ricardianism and value form. Essentially, Nick points out uh, that I think it's Aimé Césaire uh, as, a, uh, as a deputy was essentially working towards a society where capitalism and industrialism was still working full bore, but it was just redistributed the right way. And uh, whether it's market socialism or... Uh, some other version of, uh, I guess, left Ricardianism, the, the virtue of Heinrich's theorizing, I think, is to point out that you can't just leave the market in place uh, and expect everything to sort of not uh, uh, register all the shocks, quakes, volatility, and so forth that late capitalism brings. Uh, you can't just leave money there and, and not figure out to deal with the mystery of money. So it's not sort of crazy abstract Marxist theorizing. It literally has to do, what do we do if you don't want to re reproduce the first cycle of socialism where we, we are Stakhanovites building better industry and so forth, plus we're in a, you know, a climate change world. So that sort of moment has to be integrated in to, uh, the history on the ground, which is certainly taking the lead of where we should go. But we must bear in mind that that particular notion. There, there's something else that comes to my mind. Thank, thank you. Uh, thanks, Philip and, and Susan and, and Joshua. The, another question that this brings up for me is the is the question of crisis, right? Mm -hmm. And and there was there was a really good article I was just reading the other day in the new issue of of HM uh, on on this on the two these two positions on crisis that this article for me very helpfully places one is the sort of vert critique and Robert Kurtz uh, position that that uh, surplus value is a is a material substance that is the the result of of uh, the expenditure of blood and nerves and uh, et cetera of, of physiological expenditure versus the Heinrich position that that uh, surplus value is a relational instance that even though it's necessarily tied to production it's not a question of just pure circulation as Kurtz tended to to paint Heinrich into this into this uh, corner and call him just a circulationist I think to my reading, Heinrich has a very 
complex uh, reading of the of the relation of production and circulation, etc. But it but it's a relational reading, and I think that for me one of the one of the questions then, because what what's at stake in those two readings is the the, the problem of crisis and the problem of where. Kurtz had this this sort of uh, uh, necessitarian absolutist reading of of the necessary impending uh, 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 collapse imminent imminently of capitalism because of the elimination of li living labor uh, uh, etc as this as this tendential necessity and 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 I've in my own thinking I've I've very much changed camps where a few years ago I was I was really tending to see things in in that way and 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 I'm I, I'm much more um, convinced by the this relational understanding which argues that there are so many different counter tendencies that are 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 inventable and to be invented to to counteract um, falling falling profit uh, etc all of these all of these tendencies and uh, that Marx identifies and that others since have identified such that I I, I really think that the that that the problem uh, uh, can only the problem of, of collapse the problem of crisis is so complex that it that I've tried to make a, a small contribution in this instance around the question of slavery, but also really around the question of, of surplus value and, and, and accumulation and reproduction and, and crisis and, and these sorts of questions that are they're 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 not maybe at the center of what I'm saying, but they're 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 there at different instances. And I think that then the, the problem of of crisis um, Again, it, it, for me, it's important to try to get some theoretical clarity for just for myself to 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 approach the the question of crisis tendencies and necessity versus counter tendencies and all of this stuff is so complex that um, you, you know ho hopefully it's not just me educating myself in public, but I'm trying to to really get some 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 clarity, theoretical clarity about. The question of limits. What are the limits of capital? What are the limits of the creation of surplus value? How can we understand those limits? Because if we don't have a have a have have a, have a real understanding, and I and I and I really do appreciate how how Joshua how you're framing this question as beyond like const, uh, constant capital versus variable, and yet the I, uh, there there needs to be I think um, to 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 pose the very uh, question of, of limits, the limits of capital, the limits of accumulation in a, in a comprehensive way uh, requires um, th these sorts of conceptual, this conceptual work, but as, a, as, a, as an integrated process, as you're, as you're all trying to suggest. I, I agree with that completely, but I worry we're a little bit at risk of reinventing the wheel. Like we definitely don't need Michael Heinrich to know that a revolution means the <laughs> ending of markets and private sure. property, right? And that if we preserve markets and private property, the wealth is going to roll back downhill to the people who have the private property and so on and so forth. Like I, I profoundly do not need Michael for that. Um, Michael's a brilliant reader of Marx and a careful reconstructor, and that is the last thing I need him for is to make fundamentally obvious points about uh, about um, the structuration of capital and how it reproduces itself. Uh, um, but I'll also say, like, the other thing we're at risk of reinventing the wheel about is, like, I agree, this, this question of, like, the, the nature of crisis and how it works and the falling rate of profit that Susan mentioned in the crisis since the 70s, which I referred to in my talk, right, the, lo the long crisis, like, I, I don't, I, I, we, we need to integrate that thought, but there's actually a lot of work on the fact that our conception of what real, of what, of what transformative revolutionary struggle would look like um, in a context where you can no longer be pro-developmentalist for environmental reasons or because there's no more surplus value to get from it. Those are clearly the two limits, right? Um, the two limits of the end of capitalist growth um, and the limit of, of, uh, of environmental annihilation. And confronting those two limits, which have like empirical bases, right? Like we can have uh, f uh, fairly extended debates about theories of crisis, and none of them will change the fact that the 
uh, percentage of humans on the planet who do not have a formal wage contract continues to increase. And so the divergence between the working class and the proletariat continues to increase. Like no theoretical discussion can change that fact. You know, Mike Davis's book is clarion on this among others. So we don't need to puzzle those things through. These things are simply true. Um, we can no longer have a vision of like jobs for everyone because that's the end of the world. Um, and, we can, and, and so we have to have a vision of a revolutionary struggle that doesn't pass through. Sorry, I'm getting a little passionate here, but you know, the coffee's kicking in. Uh, um, uh, we can only have a vision of a revolutionary struggle that passes through increasing industrialization, increasing like, you know, developmental capacities of production, increasing like, you know, job, like, you know, wage labor for everyone. The most telling moment for me in Nick's book with which I disagreed, and there were many moments I agreed with, was the reference to um, the trajectory of Aimé Césaire's career as a democratic socialist communism. There is no such thing. There's democratic socialism and there is communism. The question of whether one leads to the other might, might, might still be open. But the collapsing of those two categories, one of which wants to continue with a productivist mode and a workerist mode and, a, and things like jobs programs, and one of which wants to end the labor relation entirely. Um, she, like we must not do that if we're gonna think about Susan's fundamental question of what revolution means in the present. And that is, she's right, the only goddamn question. If I can just quickly respond, um, I, I completely agree. If I, if I did make that conflation, hopefully I was just quoting Césaire, uh, uh, but, but my, my point was to say entirely along the lines of our discussion that Césaire's position was, was a democratic socialist one, but he often referred to himself as uh, the, uh, in alliance with communism or politically allied and but I, I don't I, I agree with you completely that that was not the position politically that he put forward at, at any moment in his career even though he the, the main point of my argument in, in in my field in francophone Caribbean studies is to try to really put Césaire's politics on the map, where he's he's it's so often just shunted aside, and 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 the important role that he played ended in his his leftist orientation ended in '56, and he was just a poet after that, after he quit the PCF, and and I really wanted to show substantially now that all of his political works are are published that that's that's just not the case, and and so you know over forty. 50 years of, of public political life his he said a lot of things about his called his political orientation a lot of things but i, I totally agree joshua with, with your your take oh uh, sorry what's the title of your book from caesar oh uh, the title well it's not done yet it could change you know there's it's still it's still subject to change but it's called uh Two, li uh, two problems, two limits to the rev. And it begins from this is their quote about how Western civilization has bequeathed us two problems, the problem of the proletariat and the problem of colonization, and then takes up the question of whether those are different, whether, whether the colonial relation and the capitalist relation are fundamentally different or fundamentally integrated. So it shares a great deal with your book, which is one of the reasons I was so grateful to have a chance to engage. Well, I think this is probably Can't a good to moment uh, uh, unless we solve the pro the tactical problems of revolution right here in the next 10 minutes, uh, <laughs> which if Joshua has another cup of coffee, it might happen. Uh, <laughs> I think we should uh, probably let our audience take a rest and our, our, our moderator who's tired after 20 days of this. And I really want to thank uh, everybody. I, I do enjoy listening to all of you so much. And I hope we will see you all again at Red May, perhaps even in person, if it ever becomes a, a embodied festival again. We ha this is our third year of six online. Who knew? But hey, uh, and everybody out there watching, uh, we do have a hiatus for a couple of days, but we go into our last week uh, next week. Uh, go to www.redmayseattle.org. And you can check out our schedule. I know Joshua's going to be back in a panel called What Was Neoliberalism? Uh, and uh, with Nikhil Pal Singh, 
uh, uh, another Red May regular and uh, Sarah Bruyette and Jamie Merchant, who's here for the first time. If you've never read Jamie Merchant, do go to Brooklyn Rail. Uh, his last article in there is, was sublime. And uh, Susan, uh, thanks for coming. Uh, maybe one year we'll get you uh, on, on critical theory, unless you've left that in the rear view mirror. Maybe we all should. I don't know. Uh, AD1. That is no, no. It's actually year one of philosophical recounting. And, it, and, right. and, I, and I just want to say one thing. I've only written one book. I've just written it about different historical conjunctures. <laughs> and this one's on the first century. But doesn't matter. Same book. So if you've read one, we could, Maybe we could compare AD1 to uh, the first year one of the revolution, as Victor Serge calls it. Well, Lots to think about. Thank you, right. everybody. And uh, uh, enjoy the rest of the day. It was great to see you. Thank you great all. Great to see Bye, you everyone. all. Thank you so much. Yeah, Bye -bye. thank you. Thank you all.